when uh, the dominance was of theist religions, when people had faced a decision, a problem, the practical guideline they received was listen to scriptures, read what is written in scriptures, this will give you an answer. Now, the rise of liberalism was not a theoretical change. It was not just a matter of philosophy. It was a practical matter of how people actually make decisions in their daily lives. If previously, when they faced a problem, say, who to marry, they open scriptures and look for the answer, now, with the rise of liberalism, the guidance was listen to your feelings. Go maybe at night, climb a high mountain, look at the moon, look at the sea, try to connect to yourself, see what you really feel, and go with your heart, go with your feelings. This was a practical guidance. It was not just theory. Now we move to the next stage, when people say, don't listen to your feelings, what do they know? Listen to Google, or listen to Amazon, or to Facebook, or whatever. They understand how you feel better than you know how, how you feel, because they have much more information, and they have much better algorithms than what natural selection gave you. They have information not only about your emails and your books and so forth, but the latest rage is that all these uh, biometric devices that you wear on your body and that get constant stream of information about your blood uh, pressure and your uh, sugar levels and whatever. And of course, do a DNA test and so forth and so forth. And if you have all this information and these superbly built algorithms, you can get much better answers than from your feelings, or certainly from the Bible. So we see the potential rise of a new kind of religion, a data religion. If previously God was in the center of events and then humans were in the center of events, now data or information becomes the supreme source of authority and of meaning in the world. It starts with simple things, like you get to an intersection in the road to turn left or to turn right. Don't listen to your feelings, listen to ways. It knows much better than your gut intuition whether to go this way or that way. Then you move to a more sophisticated level, what book to buy? We now have the technology to know you personally much better than you can ever hope to know yourself. We can track you all the time, we read all your emails, we eavesdrop on all your phone calls, and we take all this data. We also have huge statistical data databases about millions of other people and other relationships and other activities. And, we, and when we take these two together, we can tell you how to live in a way that will maximize your happiness much better than you can ever tell yourself. And it's starting to happen like with, with, with books. Like I want to read a book, to buy a new book, so I go online, Amazon tells me, look, I know you better than you know yourself. I'm telling you that you will enjoy this book much more than that book. And they, they, they now have, you know, like when you read the book, if it's, at least if it's in electronic format, the book reads you while you are reading it. And you, the book understands you better than you understand the book. Like the book knows when you stopped reading it. The book knows which pages you took a long time to read and which pages you took a short time to read. The book, maybe in like five, ten years when they connected to biometric devices, the book could know when you laughed, when you cried, when you were excited. Taking this information together, not only they can recommend which book to read, they can write the perfect book for you <laughs> that presses your emotional button in a way it will be, you know, like custom designed only for you. <laughs> and eventually we reach even questions like whom to marry. In the lives of most individuals, perhaps one of the most important questions is the question of who to marry. And now, instead of going to the priest and asking, Father, who should I marry? Or going to my parents, or trying to connect to my feelings and making bad decisions, I can ask uh, Google, dear Google, who should I marry? And Google will answer, well, I know you from the moment you were born, at least sometime in the future. I've read every email you've ever written. I've listened to every phone call you've ever made. I remember every failed date you went to. If you want, I can show you the graphs of your sugar level and blood pressure during every date and every sexual encounter you had in your lifetime. And uh, of course, I also know your potential mates, like if I'm, I have to choose between two people. So yes, I know him and I know him or her and her, just as I know you. And based on all this information, and not only on this, all this information, but based on databases of millions and millions of successful and unsuccessful relationships, I can recommend to you at a probability of 87% that you had better go with A and not with B. And one more thing, I know you so well that I also know that you're disappointed by what I just tell you. <laughs> I told you to choose A, but secretly you actually prefer B. And I also understand why you make this mistake. 
you give too much importance to physical appearances, to external beauty. Now, I'm not saying that beauty is not important. Beauty is very important, but you give it too much weight. In my calculations, which are based on these enormous statistical databases, I know that beauty counts for 9.62% of the success of a relationship. But your old-fashioned biochemical algorithms, because of things that happen in the African savanna, give <laughs> this uh, this data, beauty, they give it 27.5%, which is far too high. So believe me, even though you feel that B is the right answer, go for A. And this is an empirical question. If enough people, enough time will consult and get a good, a good answer that they will be uh, uh, happy with, then with time, more and more decisions about small things and about big things will be done in such a way. Authority will shift from the feelings, from the inner feelings of the individuals to the wisdom of these external uh, algorithms. That's what excites mathematicians so much about this currently. We're now going into the era where information and data, it will, it's just exploding and will be everything. Now, Roche, the pharmaceutical company, did an experiment a couple of years ago where they sucked the DNA out of 300 cancer tumours and sequenced it. That single experiment created more data than Roche as an entire organisation created in the century 1910 to 2010. The square kilometre array we're building now in Western Australia and South Africa, when it's up and running, will have daily data traffic equivalent to something like worldwide internet traffic. We're building another internet and it's a single device. The data we're pulling in now then creates the need for people with great mathematical and statistical skills to be able to interpret that data. The future of cancer science is mathematics. The future of astrophysics is mathematics. The future of material sciences is mathematics. Mathematical modelers, biostatisticians, algorithm makers will build this century. More data. More. Now, one reason why we have so much data in the world today is we're taking things that have always been informational, but have never been rendered into a data format, and we are putting it into data. Think, for example, of the issue of posture, the way that you are all sitting right now. The way that you sit, the way that you sit, the way that you sit, it's all different. And it's a function of your leg length and your back and the contours of your back. And if I were to put sensors, maybe 100 sensors, into all of your chairs right now, I could create an index that's fairly unique to you, sort of like a fingerprint. So what could we do with this? Researchers in Tokyo are using it as a potential anti-theft device in cars. The idea is that the carjacker sits behind the wheel, tries to stream off, but the car recognizes that a non-approved driver is behind the wheel, and maybe the engine just stops, unless you type in a password in the password into the dashboard to say, hey, I have authorization to drive. What if every single car in Europe had this technology in it? What could we do then? Maybe if we aggregated the data, maybe we could identify telltale signs that best predict that a car accident is going to take place in the next five seconds. And then what we will have datafied is driver fatigue. When the car senses that the person slumps into that position, automatically knows, honk inside to say, hey, wake up, pay more attention to the road. It used to be that if you wanted to get a computer to do something new, you would have to program it. Now, programming, for those of you who haven't done it yourself, requires laying out in excruciating detail every single step that you want the computer to, achieve, to do in order to achieve your goal. Now, if you want to do something that you don't know how to do yourself, then this is going to be a great challenge. So this was the challenge faced by this man, Arthur Samuel. In 1956, he wanted to get this computer to be able to beat him at checkers. How can you write a program that be better than you at checkers? So he came up with an idea. He had the computer play against itself thousands of times and learn how to play checkers. And indeed, it worked. And in fact, by 1962, this computer had beaten the Connecticut state champion. Instead of instructing a computer what to do, we are going to simply throw data at the problem and tell the computer to figure it out for itself. How do you think we have self-driving cars? Memory is cheaper. No. Algorithms are faster. No. Processors are better. No. All those things matter, but that's not why. It's because we changed the nature of the problem. We changed the nature of the problem from one in which we try to overtly and explicitly explain to the computer how to drive to one in which we say, here's a lot of data around the vehicle, and you figure it out. One of the most amazing examples I've seen of machine learning happened where a team run uh, by a guy called Jeffrey Hinton from the University of Toronto won a competition for automatic drug discovery. Now, what was extraordinary here is not just that they beat all of the algorithms developed by Merck or the international academic community, but nobody on the team had any background in chemistry or biology or life sciences, and they did it in two weeks. How did they do this? They used an extraordinary algorithm called deep learning. 
Deep learning is an algorithm inspired by how the human brain works. And as a result, it's an algorithm which has no theoretical limitations on what it can do. The more data you give it and the more computation time you give it, the better it gets. Deep learning is this extraordinary thing. It's a single algorithm that can seem to do almost anything. And I discovered that a year earlier, it had also learned to see. In Stanford, a group there announced that looking at tissues under magnification, they've developed a machine learning-based system which in fact is better than human pathologists at predicting uh, survival rates for cancer sufferers. The system being shown here can identify those areas more accurately, or about as accurately as human pathologists, but was built entirely with deep learning using no medical expertise by people who have no background in the field. Similarly here, this neuron segmentation, um, we can now segment neurons about as accurately as humans can, but this system was developed with deep learning using people with no previous background in medicine. And I think the, the next big story is data. The basic myth which you see starting to emerge from Silicon Valley is that the entire universe is a flow of data. Everything in the universe is just different patterns of data flow. All organisms are algorithms. All or organisms, giraffes, tomatoes, humans, and flu viruses are just different data processing systems. Up till now, the most successful, the most advanced algorithms in the universe were humans, which was why it was a good reason to sanctify humans. They are the best data processing systems in the world, but we are now creating better data systems than humans, and humans will move aside, and the future will belong to uh, completely different kinds of algorithms. Um, this is my personal guess uh, where uh, we are heading to in the 21st, 22nd century, data replacing humanism as the uh, central myth of history. So I'm very excited about the opportunities. I'm also concerned about the problems. Uh, the problem here is that every area in blue on this map is somewhere where services are over 80% of employment. What are services? These are services. These are also the exact things that computers have just learned how to do. What does that mean? Well, it'll be fine. It'll be replaced by other jobs. For example, there'll be more jobs for data scientists. Well, not really. It doesn't take data scientists very long to build these things. For example, these four algorithms were all built by the same guy. So if you think, oh, it's all happened before, you know, we've seen the results in the past of when new things come along and they get replaced by new jobs, what are these new jobs going to be? We have seen this once before, of course. In the Industrial Revolution, we saw a step change in capability thanks to engines. The machine learning revolution is going to be very different to the industrial revolution. This human performance grows at this gradual rate, but we now have a system, deep learning, that we know actually grows in capability exponentially. The machine learning re revolution never settles down. The better computers get at intellectual activities, the more they can build better computers to be better at intellectual capabilities. So this is going to be a kind of change that the world has actually never experienced before. So your previous understanding of what's possible is different. Think about a lab technician who's looking through a microscope at a cancer biopsy and determining whether it's cancerous or not. The person went to university, and that person's job, as well as an entire fleet of professionals like that person, is going to find that their jobs are radically changed or actually completely eliminated. My son turned six yesterday. What advice would you give him as he prepares for a world of robotics and artificial intelligence? Um, is that nothing they teach him in the educational system today is really relevant to the... Uh, <laughs> to, to the world in which he, he will actually live. He, uh, the most important uh, capacity he will need to have is to, all the, throughout life, learn. There will be no ending to learning and to reinventing ourselves again and again and again, because the situation in which you learn things until you are 20 or 25, and then most of life you just work in whatever you learned or, or use whatever wisdom you've gained, it's not going to work anymore. The pace of change is so fast that uh, you'll have to learn all your life.